What's the retail price of this? Well, that's part of the fun of it because these are retailing for 32 pounds a bottle. No, they're not. We heard a rumor that Barry Brothers and Rudd, the UK's oldest wine and spirit merchant, was putting out the best value whiskey anywhere. So naturally, we had to go find out for ourselves. This is what I was talking about, the real tennis court. So Henry VIII oh, wow. had his real tennis court. This is the back wall of his real tennis court. We sat down at number three, St. James Street, with Ronnie Cox. I'm not going to give you my house key unless I completely trust you. You should not to me destroy the place. Key. Have it back. The man whose name is on the bottle to bring you the inside scoop of what might be the best value whiskey you can buy. If this is your first time watching a Top Whiskeys video, make sure you click the subscribe button. We do new whiskey videos every week and we give away a free bottle of premium whiskey every month. So make sure you don't miss out. Oh, well, just let's get into the sherry. The sherry cask here uh, is a collection of sherry casks, which as you know, these are, these are Spanish uh, sherry casks. Um, we do use American sherry casks as well, so wood that comes over from the United States of America and we ship it down to southern Spain, or used to. Um, but when you're, you're looking at a sherry cask, you're lo really looking at Spanish sherry casks as far as we're concerned. This is a, a space side distillery and it has been brought up in a sherry cask. To me, sherry cask is probably the most complex of casks. If you look at a first fill or a second fill cask, um, they, they continue to deliver time after time lovely resinous properties, dried fruity properties, um, chocolatey notes to it. And then you'll probably get on the back of this, you'll get a dried fruity nose to it. It's very typical of the Oloroso sherry. I was going to say, it, it is, it's it's certainly not like a Pedro Jimenez cask. No, 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 no. It hasn't got that sweetness to it. It's no. more of a sort of savoury style. Mm. And uh, uplifting, uplifting, I, I like to define it very simply, an uplifting conversation, relaxation. It's really interesting, the, the mouthfeel, it's, it's got a lot of depth and complexity to character, but it's certainly not a strong mouthfeel. It doesn't. It's not. It's not cloying. No, not, no, 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 or oily. No, no. No, which no, no. which gives you a lot of depth and clarity of flavor. I think you can really appreciate what the sherry cask has done to this. Yes, without because, having had the viscosity. Of yeah. The, of the, of the, yeah. Exactly. There's really nothing to distract you. The danger of this one is what I call slightly Moorish. So. You've got the reminder there, and it says, "Okay, I think it's about time you went back again." Another sip, don't you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very important yeah, yeah. to have this bottle quite close at hand because mm. otherwise you'd give up. You'd get up. And... Mm. And, uh, obviously, historical um, and a very important part of Berry Brothers and Rudd. Uh, uh, here, for instance, is happens to open up on the page of Lord Byron. If we ever put something in a bottle which is going to compromise that sort of fame, you can easily destroy what 300 years is built up in a second. If you put your nose in there, it takes you straight away to the island of Ireland. It all just evokes those memories of Ireland. It's got a fruitiness on the front of the palate, which sort of kind of counteracts the smokiness. A lot of people find it very difficult to find things other than smoke in a smoky whiskey, especially when they're beginning. Mm. You don't have to kind of consciously park the smokiness in the back of the head and look underneath for something else. There's a kind of balance there, which mm. is, I hope it's, if you will find it delightful. Mm. Um, and it's a great introduction to a sophisticated, elegant style of, of Isla. Uh, it doesn't slap your own face, as you say. And what's the retail price of this? Well, that's part of the fun of it, because these are retailing for £32 a bottle. No, no. You know, the average price of a bottle of wine in Mary Bells Road is £27. The average price of a bottle of wine in the supermarkets is just under £6. It's not the same wine, obviously. We felt that there was an enormous benefit by having something which is approachable, which is really, for, for people who don't really understand whiskies to start off with, and to put something in a, in, in a in glass, which we're incredibly proud of, don't have to make a huge amount of money out of it, but basically what we're saying that this is berries, this is what you can buy for this sort of price, you don't have to pay your 100 pounds a bottle. And this is for people who find smoke just too offensive, just too aggressive. 
like drinking an ashtray, you know, mm. so some people describe whiskey as like that. I did used to find it quite difficult to uh, find out a real, the true character of a, peated, a very heavily peated whiskey. And until somebody said to me, probably, but it's just like putting your shirt on in the morning. You know, you're putting it on and you can feel it on, but then you move on. You move on to the next thing, you get your trousers on, and then you know that you know, but you don't think about it the rest of the day. It's there. It, it, you know, it, it, it's done. So you've parked that, um, and then you look for other things. This has got peat in it, but this is the mild form yeah. of peated whiskey. And the, you know, if you finish in peated casks, you can you can do that as well, which has a, a delicious effect uh, if you do it at the right time, and you can overdo it. But you, you, if you do it for in my case, I've done it on several occasions, but for six weeks is probably enough. So that actually on the nose, you've still got the character of the distillery, but at the back of the palate, then suddenly comes this waft like a flying carpet through of, of the smokiness, which is, is just from the finish of the cask. It's so interesting to be able to taste these kinds of flavors mixed together, because that, that smoke is like a backbone that lots of flavors are hanging off of. Absolutely you, right. You Absolutely get it. You right. get it coming all the way through from the start to the finish, but there's so many nuances to it. There's a lot of there's a lot of meat on the bones. A lot of meat on the bones, and there's just that happy memory, that thread that's, that's as you say, the backbone, which is the the smokiness coming through, but in a, in a deliciously elegant sort of way. So it's it's not a it's not a typical Isla style of whiskey. Uh, and it's more to do with the sort of Highland, old-style Highland whiskey. To take smoke as a sort of 60 or 70 percent of the top flavors in, in the island, um, smoke here is like 5 percent or 7 percent, I suppose. It's there, um, and people who are sensitive to smoke will pick it up very quickly. But it's actually on the nose, fruitiness is probably the predominant nose to it. I don't know if, if you gave this to me, and perhaps after a couple of whiskeys, uh, I might not necessarily pick up smoke as one of mm. my first tasting notes, or mm. smelling mm. notes. I think you're probably right. It, it's certainly there. It's there it's, in the background. Uh, it's just a kiss, really. A little whiff of yeah. smoke. Yeah. And that's what we wanted to try and do, to tell people that actually it's not all about really heavy, you know, take the top off this and somebody walks in here and says, where the hell's the fire? Like a genie out of the bottle and just says, look, everybody <laughs> wants me. Everybody wants me. <laughs> and we don't all want you, actually, to be honest. Um, there comes a stage where you want something else slightly more um, full, you know, and, and demonstrative of the distillery itself. This has a different uh, different top on it. I don't know what, which one's the most modern one. I think these are... I think they're all like this, supposed to be like this now. Mm. First, the first lot sold out pretty damn fast. Uh, At 32 we, pounds, I'm not surprised. Well, I, I think that's true, yeah. This one, I'd say, is the, the cleanest cut of distinct flavors. Whether yeah. or not you're a person who's able to pick out distinct flavors, you can certainly tell, I get a flavor from this, I get this other distinct flavor. And it might be, for some people, difficult to put a name to those flavors, but you can pick out very distinctive profiles on your palate. And if you were to walk into a Swedish shop and you just look around those and you smell this and you probably go, okay, it's that one. Okay, it's that one. It's yes. Edinburgh chalk. It's those bullseyes. It's those humbugs. It's those, which to me just takes me up to the glens of that part of the world. Very typical of the, the smells you get in a fresh early morning walk mm. in summer. Dew on the ground and pears in the middle palate, reasonably dry in the back. Just a fresh burst of fruitiness. Anyone who wants to appreciate and understand what these flavors are meant to taste like, this is the range to try. Because you can experience a very clear, distinctive way to know what peat tastes like, what Isla tastes like, what Sherry tastes like, what Space Side tastes like. And you can then compare all of those other whiskeys you have from those different areas to this, and this becomes sort of your base and your starting point. And that's what we were setting out to do at a reasonable price point, so it, it didn't hurt people too badly. You know, if, if each of these had cost £120, we wouldn't have had any success whatsoever, I'm sure no. of it. Um, and you know, people feel that a vatted malt is not necessarily as good as a single malt, and hopefully this 
demonstrates that it's not necessarily true. This is a picture of a chap called Pussyfoot Johnson. This man here, Pussyfoot Johnson, was probably the leading persuader of the president's president of the United States of America to introduce prohibition in 1920. He's called Pussyfoot Johnson, but he um, was a great abstinence man, and he was a great supporter of any movement towards abstinence. And he was greatly successful in the United States, and they introduced it. And in 1921, a year later, he happened to meet Mr. Berry, who, for some fortuitous reason, was on the same vessel, the White Steamer, uh, the White Line Steamer, coming back from the United States of America to London. I presume Mr. Berry had been there selling to the embassies, because obviously he wouldn't be allowed to go into uh, a market which was um, where it was illegal to sell any wines or spirits. And they obviously had an altercation, or at least they had dinner the night before, because something inspired Mr. Pussyfoot Johnson to write a letter to Mr. Berry which says, Dear Mr. Berry, permit me to recommend that your son be trained for the cloth rather than for the wine trade, which I assure you is a vanishing industry. Now, they're going to have a dram.